Hello and welcome back. Ladies and gentlemen, it's good to see you all. Let's begin. In the face of massive natural disaster, what do we say in response to the question, where was God? My friends, we live in an age where even the church has tried to become politically correct. We've tried to candy coat God into a, into a nice little God, a God who loves and never hurts anyone. He never gets angry at sin or judges or condemns anyone, let alone sending them to hell. See, in our efforts to sell God to the world, we have sugarcoated the awesome reality of God. And then we question why people don't take God or the Bible seriously. Why is there no fear of God in the world? See, in our efforts to get converts, we have told only of God's love and have avoided the burning holiness and his fearsome wrath. We, we've left it in the Old Testament as if God has changed or evolved into a kinder, gentler God who overlooks our sin and just wants to bless us. Church, we are in for a rude awakening. You see, we cannot keep avoiding the Bible passages that speak of God's wrath and pretend like they don't exist. If we do, we are spiritually and morally negligent. Let's pray. Father God, we pray for those who have been devastated in this week's tornado outbreak in Tennessee, Arkansas, Missouri, and Kentucky. Father, we remember those who have lost their lives so suddenly. We hold in our hearts, Father, the families forever changed by this grief and loss. Father God, bring them consolation and comfort. Father, surround them with our prayer and strength. Father God, bless those who have survived and heal their memories of trauma and devastation. And may they have the courage to face the long road of rebuilding ahead. Father, we ask your blessings on all those who have lost their homes, their livelihood, their security, and their hope. Father God, bless the work of relief agencies and those providing emergency assistance. Father, may their work be guided by the grace and strength that comes from you and you alone. And Father, help us to respond with generosity and prayer and assistance and in aid to the best of our abilities. Father, keep our hearts focused on the needs of those affected, even after the crisis is over. We ask this in Jesus Christ's name, amen. Romans 12, 2 says, let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. And what should we think about the recent spawn of devastating tornadoes this past week? And what does it say about God? What does it say about us? Does the Bible have anything to say about the issue? And to answer the last question first, yes, it does. Uh, more directly than you might think. The seas have lifted up, O oh Lord. The seas have lifted up their voice. The seas have lifted up their pounding weights. Mightier than the thunder of the great waters. Mightier than the breakers of the sea. The Lord on high is mighty. Psalm 93, 3 through 4. And thinking about the most recent tornadic destruction, that scripture is principle one. God is mighty. We, we see that in nature. We often marvel at it. We watch a sunset. We hike to the top of a mountain. We catch a 27-pound Chinook salmon. But family, we're also terrified by it. Being terrified challenges our, our thinking. Our thinking about God. Is God good? Is God strong? About life. Is it really that fragile and about control? And does that last one surprise you? As we affirm the might of God, what we are affirming is that God is in control and that you and I are not. You see, we don't like that very much. It's uncomfortable with our complete and utter dependence on God for our existence. I felt that as I watched numerous video clips, the havoc was everywhere in Mayfield. In Mayfield, Kentucky, it was in every home, in every street, in every building. It just came. The force of the devastation was from wind speeds upward of 288 miles per hour, spanning over four states. See, family, I think a little bit of discomfort about God is a good thing. As we are mindful of the might of God, we also see some of the wildness of God. God is not tame. God is not a gentle lap cat who will climb up into your lap and purr when you pet him. Family, God is much more like a lion. We must be forever mindful that God's might is not under our control. 
He cannot be tamed by us. God does not exist to pander to our desires, no matter how often we misquote Psalm 37, 4. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. It is uncomfortable, but it is also true. God is mighty. More precisely, God is almighty. All of the power of the entire universe is a mere reflection of the might of God. Because God is the originator of it and the source of it. And next to that power and might, you and I feel very, very small and very powerless. Because though we don't like to say it, we are small and powerless. But we, family, are also adopted. And that is precisely why the Prince of God is mighty. It's okay for all of us who have a relationship with God. God is almighty. He is also in power. And he has also invited us to be his children. And by the way, that is also precisely why it's okay for us not to be in control. Because we are the children and God is the boss. Principle number two, God is good. And that brings us to the next problem. See, if we accept principle number one, that God is mighty, and then take refuge in the fact that, that we are God's children, does it necessarily follow that God should use all of his power to protect his children? So narrow-minded people, racist, bigots, would only go this far and conclude that disasters such as this are, are God punishing all of those who are not his children. That this is God's vengeance, God's judgment against people who have rejected him. I say poppycock. That this is a false portrayal of God as a tyrant, mindlessly wiping out hundreds of thousands of people, many of whom were God's children. And we cannot retreat into a simplistic conclusion. We need to go into a more difficult place. And that is principle number two. God is good. In his very nature, his very essence, we must affirm that God is good. That was Jesus' pronouncement. No one is good except God alone, Mark 10, 18. And, and see, this is a, a sticking point for many who do not believe. They look at events such as this past week and they say, if God is able to do something to stop that kind of loss of life, and does not, how can you say God is good? That is an excellent question. Does anyone want to take a crack at the answer? For me, the answer comes back to the nature of the relationship. I am only a child in relationship to God. Now I say only in terms of my ability to understand the ways of my father, not in any way to diminish the privilege of being a child of God, but in my ability to understand what goodness is. I am but a child. A simple illustration. I remember when my daughter, Kaylin, was very young. She was hungry before dinner one night, and I offered her some mini marshmallows. And that was quite good of me, right? And she thought so. At least until I said that was enough. See, and then she didn't think I was so good. Family, the analogy fits. Only God defines what is good. You see, there are not only the two options that first appear in the face of, of bad things, being a supercell tornado that affect entire states or the more personal bad things in your life. In the beginning, we first only see two options. God is either not strong enough to stop them or not good enough to stop them. But my friends, there's a third option, which leads us to principle three. God is with us. You see, maybe there's something better, something more good than being spared from the things that we see as evil. Maybe there's a bigger plan, a higher purpose, something far greater that, that God has in mind for you and me than simply living a life free from tragedy, hurt, or even persecution or hatred. And, and I'm not talking about simply seeing the good that came out of it. And yet, yes, seeing our country come together and reach out in human kindness is a good thing that comes from tragedy. Yes, seeing individuals understand how fortunate they are and seeing them choose to donate money and time is a good thing. Yes, we hear stories of great survival and great self-sacrifice. And I acknowledge those as good outcomes of a bad situation, but that's, that's not a good line of reasoning. 
You see, that type of reasoning takes us to a place of trying to balance good outcomes with bad outcomes. That line of thought ultimately forces us to add up all the good and all the bad and somehow make the bad things seem worthwhile. When I say that there's something beyond the two choices of, of God not being good enough or God not being mighty enough, I don't mean the good that comes out of it. I mean this, principle number three, God is with us. See, God never promised us an easy life. God never promised us that bad things would never happen. We, we would never lose a loved one. We would never be treated unfairly. We would never be personally affected by natural disaster. What God did promise is that he would be with us. I want you to come with me to Isaiah 61. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to preach the good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn and provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. They will be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. And those are familiar words, not so much because of their original place in Isaiah, but more because, family, this was the passage Jesus read at the very beginning of his ministry. It speaks directly to the point of all that we've been saying. Principle one, God is mighty and in control. The spirit of the sovereign Lord. Principle two, God is good. We, we see it in every line that follows. Principle three is God is with us. We see it in the very person of Jesus. God is with us. And notice most of all the difference that it makes that God is with us. Good news to the poor. The binding up of broken hearts. Freedom for the captives. Comfort for the mourners. Beauty for ashes. Oil of gladness instead of mourning. Praise instead of despair. What makes the difference? What makes the difference? Does God, does God restore all of these losses, deposit money in our bank accounts, bring back the loved ones? No. Tell me what makes the difference is that God comes and enters into our loss with us. He comes and shares our pain and the pain of our world. And that family makes a difference. If you don't understand that, it's maybe because you have never experienced it. You've never let God be with you in your hurt. You have taken your own heart captive to the pain and nurtured anger and bitterness instead of opening yourself to God and allowing God to come in and join you. You have fought and held on instead of releasing and inviting. You have done everything you could to stay in control instead of letting God be in control. And if you don't understand that, it's maybe because you've been convinced by the lie rampant in our world it says outer stuff, material things, even physical health is more important than inner stuff, like our hearts, our character, our maturity and completeness, our relationship with God. In God's economy, our inner lives are far more important than the outer things. And that, and that I think is one of the keys to understanding and responding to the bad things that happen in our world. God cares more about our character than our comfort. God cares more about our joy than our happiness. See, God cares more about our hearts being good than our bank accounts being full. James puts it this way. Consider pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. James 1, 2 through 4. Let me tell you, it really is worth it. Knowing the presence of God is with you in your life is worth every bit of hardship that we might experience in this fallen world. And I'm aware that I have not answered the big question why. And that is simply because there is no answer. Kaylin didn't understand why she couldn't eat all the marshmallows that she desired. And I don't understand why God would create a world with tornadoes to destroy. So I've chosen to talk about what we do know through God's word and his spirit. God is mighty. And we see that in the world around us. God is good. We know that from scripture and from our own lives, including the times of difficulty. 
And God is with us, joining in our lives and in our experiences, informing us through them. And beyond those principles, I turn to Isaiah 58, verse 8 through 9. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I give you praise and honor for for who you are. I fear you because you are the almighty God who created the whole universe. I therefore live in all in total submission to you. Father God, help me to overcome the spirit of fear that wants to sabotage my life and the gift and the purpose which you would call me to do. In your son's name, Jesus Christ, amen. And again, thank you for being here. Family, if you're looking for a secure, faith-based way to donate to the victims of the tornado outbreak, um, visit the Convoy of Hope. I'll leave the link in the description. And also this, a little bit of housekeeping. Recently, UBG online subscribers surpassed 20,000. I humbly thank you for that and for your support. Together, we can change hearts and minds. And that's all I have for today. Until next week, God bless you and your family. Stay safe. Thank you.